you know, we're such at a, such an exciting point in um, our church journey, guys. We've just come to the end uh, today of our uh, vision and values series, you know, our vision statement that I'm sure is burning on all of your hearts as it is on mine, but we're, we're a, a church family that uh, revel in Jesus, that seek to see lives restored and seek to see communities revived. And, you know, Ali has, has walked us through that vision statement and, you know, he linked it back to Isaiah 58, which I think for us as a church community is, it's a real significant passage of scripture. There's so much in there that God is saying to us. And can I encourage you as we're coming out of lockdown and as we're going to meet together, really mull over that scripture, because I think as, as Ronnie has shared this morning, you know, it's time for us to arise as a people. You know, we need to take the gospel out to love and serve the lost, the broken, the poor and the marginalized in our society in and around Chesley Street and beyond. You know, Ali walked us through um, our six kind of key values as Redeemer Church, um, grace and power, you know, that we know as believers that in Jesus, we are saved by grace. But it is a gift of grace and of, of God's mercy outworked in each one of our lives that we are redeemed. You know, Ali taught us through that we are to be a, a family that are authentic and hilariously generous, you know. At having relationships with each other and built on trust and integrity and transparency. You know, I love it in Acts 4, where it speaks about, you know, the, the New Testament church. And in Acts 4, 34, it says, there was not a needy person among them. Come on, Redeemer Church. Come on, let's be like that. Let's, let's, let's be passionately coming alongside each other and supporting each other in prayer. And, and if there's needs, let, let's come on, let's step up and meet those needs. And then finally, Ali taught us through, you know, courage and mercy. You know, and this is a big, big challenge. You know, we are, we are called to be, as Ronnie has so faithfully declared this morning, we're called to be a people that a step out of the shadow, step out of hiding and arise. Come on, let's be this courageous, merciful community. Let's be a, a house of mercy that people are so attracted to because Jesus is there. And who cannot be attracted to our beautiful saviour, Jesus? So this all brings us to um, today's passage that we're going to walk through together. It's such a great point in, in Acts, you know, Here's, here's Paul and, you know, him and Barnabas were part of this flagship church in Antioch. And as we'll read today through this passage in Acts, you'll see how Paul kind of comes out of hiding in, in some respects as well. And he goes right to the heart of where everybody's at. So, you know, let's let's reorientate our hearts this morning and, and really just tune in on what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Already God is speaking. He's speaking through the worship with Lindsay and Caleb. He's speaking through what Tom shared. He's speaking through what Ronnie shared. And, you know, let's, let's hear the Holy Spirit today and let's respond as well. So if you've got a Bible there, guys, grab your Bible. Um, Will, uh, Will's going to put the, um, the passage up on the screen here. So let's read along. And it is, you know, as it has been, we, you know, there's been a lot of, lot of long Bible passages, but God's word is powerful. You know, it speaks in the Psalms, I've hidden your word in my heart, but I might not sin against you. So let's get God's word into our hearts deeply this morning. So I'll read, um, I'm reading from the ESV guys. So just uh, follow along with me, Acts 17, 16 to 34. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. And he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, uh, however you pronounce that, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know you, therefore, 
what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Well done. All right, yep, thanks, Will. Uh, for as I passed along and observed the objects of worship, I found also an altar with the inscription to the, the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs anything, since he himself gives to us all mankind life, breath, and everything. And he made for one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and, and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he actually is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being like God, uh, sorry, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image being formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also was Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Damamas and others with them. Great. <clears throat> Thanks. So, you know, as I say, this passage finds us um, right at the heart of Athens. You know, here's Paul in the cultural centre of, of Greece, the cultural centre of the known world of the time. You know, and Paul has journeyed with Timothy, Timothy and Silas. But at this point, he's here on his own in Athens. And Luke, the writer of Acts, really kind of brings home that in the preceding chapters to this point that, you know, the church that is built, and, and this goes for us today, guys, as well, is a multi-ethnic community. Isn't that a joy that we can come from all different backgrounds, yet we come together as, as one new man in Christ. And today, this passage draws out some real key questions that I'm going to kind of walk us through in the let's say 20 minutes or so that we've got together. And the questions that I want us to kind of think about today is what are idols and unknown gods? And then secondly, how are we making the true God known in our context? Now, in verse 23 of our passage today, Paul says, for as I passed along and observed the objects of worship, I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you. You know, today in our culture, idols are everywhere. They're perhaps not as obvious as in Paul's walking in Athens because there will have been sculptures and everything everywhere. But, you know, the idols are still there in our society today, still surrounding us. And this morning, you know, the question really is, what are we treasuring? What are we treasuring today? What are we desiring? What are we willing to sacrifice for? You know, the dictionary definition of an idol is someone who you love or admire or an image or statue, an object, you know, something that is worshipped by a people who believe in a God. But, you know, I think that's such a, a, a simplistic definition. I feel the biblical definition of uh, idolatry really just hammers it home to us today, really what, it, what it's all about. And that's really caught up in um, 
Colossians 3 verses 5 and 6, where it says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. So, you know, idolatry is dangerous because the wrath of God there in that text comes upon it. And we hear and see that the wrath of God comes upon it because God is a jealous God. We know as a society, you know, the word jealousy just brings such, you know, negative connotations, doesn't it? It, it makes you think of someone who's really envious and selfish and self-seeking and, and looking out for their own kind of selfish desires. But, you know, our God is a jealous God because, you know, he passionately, unceasingly seeks after us. And he wants us to passionately, unceasingly and completely devotedly seek after him. You know, John Piper puts it like this in kind of describing God as a jealous God and speaking about idolatry. God's jealousy is not only righteous, so deserves our deepest and strongest affections. He also is loving. Therefore, his jealousy is a loving jealousy. We, as we were made to find our greatest joy when he is our greatest treasure. Now, let's hear that this morning, Redeemer. Let's hear that. What? What? That again, we are made, we are made, we are created by God to find our greatest joy when he, when God alone is our greatest treasure. He is jealous that he be honoured and we worshipped. He is jealous that we are satisfied, completely satisfied in him because he is both loving and righteous. So, you know, when we place anything before God as our ultimate satisfaction, we not only dishonour him, but we, we actually destroy a part of ourselves as well. And Paul describes this kind of disordered love as, as covetousness. You know, we're loving something more than God. And who we ought, uh, you know, we're loving something more than God, what we ought to be loved less than God. So, you know, God doesn't then have the central place. He is not treasured in our hearts because we are putting something before him. So ultimately, an idol is a thing or person that we love more than God and treasure more than him. You know, guys, that could be academic achievement wanting to succeed. It could be a relationship, say, with a spouse. It could be money, sex, uh, approval of people, a hobby, a sport, a uh, beauty, whatever it is. If it's, if it's in the place before us of greater importance than God, then today I would say that, that's idolatry. The Bible is so clear on that. Because, you know, our greatest joy is when Christ and is at his is our greatest treasure. You know, Romans, <clears throat> Romans 1.25 says, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So let's, let's treasure God. Let's treasure God above all things. Let's put him first. Let, uh, let the cry of Redeemer Church be, God is first in redeemer you know but thanks be to god for he is abundantly rich in mercy you know if if he left us in our idolatrous state we would suffer as the bible is clear we would the full wrath of god upon us but paul draws it out in 1 thessalonians 9 and 10 where he says, 
For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then verse 10 is the is the clincher, which is just so beautiful. It's just it's it just portrays the gospel so well. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, Jesus, guys, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, let's hear that today. You know, we know that the wrath of God comes against idolatry. But thanks be to God that Jesus stands in that place for us before the Father, bearing that wrath upon himself on the cross. But by his grace and his mercy, we may receive salvation and forgiveness of our sins. God intentionally seeks us out. God intentionally came as Jesus, fully man, fully God, to die for me, to die for you, to die for the world. So let's grasp hold of that today. Let's grasp hold of the fact that we have the gospel in our hearts, the words of life burning in our breasts. But we need to get out and declare as Ronnie has already just so faithfully encouraged us to do. Let's arise, church. Let's arise. Let's come out of hiding. Let's, you know, shine the light of Christ that shines forth. So, you know, Luke 19, 10 speaks about that he has come, you know, to seek and save the lost. He's come to rescue us. He's come to redeem us and he's come to restore us, you know. Christ does not leave us where we're at, but we, in coming to know Christ and the Holy Spirit working through each one of our lives, are shaped as one new man, one new man to declare his beauty and his majesty. Because, you know, idols have the illusion that they will satisfy. Oh, if I just have an extra thousand pounds, I'm going to be happy. Or if I just um, have this relationship or be happy or if I just raise to this academic height or oh, I'll be happy and there is the illusion that all these things have life and what we're seeking in them but it is that it is an illusion they are actually empty they're much like the idols that Paul saw in Athens you know lifeless things but in marked contrast Jesus has what we're looking for Jesus has life. He declares of himself, he is the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And it's by his grace and that grace that worked in each one of our lives. But we can see the stronghold of idolatry be broken over us. And I pray today that you will see that you will see Christ come in and break any stronghold of idolatry in your life and in my life. I, I pray for myself as much as you guys, because I'm as guilty of idolatry as you are. But thanks be to God who is rich in mercy and grace and love. So that's great, Matt. You may say that's that's wonderful. Thanks for telling us about idolatry but and, and being set free from it by the gospel but how do we live that out how do we see that outworks in our day-to-day -day lives well as you'll see in verse 17 of our passage today Paul takes it right into the marketplace and in this second question about you know how we are making God known in our context today. I really want us to kind of look at the marketplace. What is the marketplace? What does really the marketplace mean in this passage in Acts? But also what's our marketplace where God has us? You know, back in, in Athens, you know, the marketplace back then and commentators say this, but it really was the hub of the community. That, that all the offices, all the shops all the temples everything was there or every piece of kind of day-to-day -day life was done in that marketplace so you know as i was praying and, and and preparing like god was really stirring in my heart you know what are our marketplaces where where can we live and outwork the gospel today you know are we called as christians 
to have our kind of private marketplace. Do you know what I mean? Like, like just be in our home with people that we're comfortable with and actually just live our Sunday Christian lives, whether at the moment on Zoom, you know, we connect in on a Sunday and then Monday comes and we just don't step out as much in faith as we should. I, I, I just don't believe that's right. You know, we're called to be faithful and step out in faith, in full assurance of faith, in Christ, knowing that the Holy Spirit equips us to, for good works in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're called to step out into our marketplace before us today, guys. Come on, let's step out into Chesley Street. Let's, let's step out to see the lost, the broken, the marginalised come to Christ. Let's step out at the school gate when we're picking up our children. Let's step out in our office environments, even on Zoom. Let's just step out. Let's be bold. Let's step out in sharing Jesus. Sharing Jesus, sharing the gospel, because it's only by the gospel that lives are transformed. It's only through the gospel of grace we are redeemed. It's only by the gospel that Christ is that substitutionary atonement for us, allowing us to be set free from our sin. I love the illustration in 2 Kings 5. It's a story that I, I adore. And if you've not read it, please, after um, this preach, after church today, get into the Old Testament. The Old Testament is just so powerful. Well, the whole Bible is powerful. But I love this story in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 5, where it speaks about Naaman. Now, Naaman was a prime minister. He had everything going for him. He, he was, you know, he was like there close alongside the king, you know, and he had this horrendous skin disease, leprosy at the time. And he, he then had heard that there was a prophet in Israel who, if he went to, then the prophet would pray for him and his leprosy would go. Now, Naaman was quite a proud man, as you can imagine, his position um, made him quite proud. But he, he sought out this, this prophet, Elisha, and he found him and Elisha told it, tells him to go and wash in the Jordan River. So he goes um, initially resistantly because he's like, again, a proud man, but he washes and his leprosy just is cleansed. And after that cleansing, there is this kind of wonderful kind of change in Naaman. Like you could almost say he almost like had a conversion experience. Now, you could argue that Naaman would want to be close to Elisha and, and not go back to his old life in, in this, you know, very, you know, secular society of the time. But no, he chooses to go back. But he, he gets them to gather bags of soil. Now, what a weird thing. How, why did he need all these bags of soil? Well, you know, what he does is he knows that there is a, part of his job was to, to, for this old king to lean on Naaman when he prayed to this foreign god. So because of that, Naaman would have to bow as well. But he knew that actually God alone, God alone should be worshipped. So in actually bowing down, he, he would almost be, he would be committing idolatry. So, in, so, so that not only he knew, but those around him knew that in him bowing down, he wasn't bowing to a foreign god. He was bowing to the god of God, the king of kings, the maker of heaven and earth. He would get his servants to spread like soil. I, I can imagine the picture would have been hilarious, you know, like all these like bags of soil being taken into this foreign temple for Naaman to, to kneel on. But it was soil from Israel. It was soil from God's, God's kingdom. And he, it was his public declaration that he was worshipping God, even though he was bowing in a foreign temple to support the king, he was worshipping God. Now, that was his marketplace. He chose not to hide his faith, but he chose to bring his faith right into the marketplace so that all people could see. So today, let's hear the, the, the challenge from Paul in Acts. Let's hear the challenge that God stirred in Ronnie this morning for us as Redeemer. 
let's hear that God is wanting each and every one of us to come faithfully and shine in our marketplace. Now, you know, guys, your marketplace isn't insignificant. It is so significant because God has placed you by the school gate, in the home environment, in the work environment, in the gym, wherever he has placed you, he's placed you there so that you may proclaim his righteousness, his goodness and his mercy. So as a community of believers together, let's actively be encouraging one another. God being our greatest treasure and therefore our greatest joy. We should be overflowing with a deep love for the Lord and a real love for one another. Our lives should be shining with the gospel to all those around us. And, you know, Isaiah 58 verses 6 to 12 that that Will's going to put up on the screen now I think just captures this and I know I feel it's almost like bookended our our preaching series and and quite rightly because this is this is what should be the heartbeat of Redeemer so guys get your Bibles out again let's let's read this together as as a church family and and really grasp the truth of the gospel in this and the challenge that this passage brings to us is it not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him? Is it not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. And if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing finger and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a well-watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise, raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repair of the breach and the restorer of the streets to dwell in. So in conclusion, guys, who or what are we treasuring? Who or what is, is, is our treasure? Is it God or is it something else? You know, God has called us as Redeemer together to live out our day, daily lives interwoven with each other, to be more like the Acts 4 believers. We are Redeemer, seeking to be compassionately gracious, coming alongside and walking with each other through all seasons of life. We are Redeemer, hilarious in generosity, reliant on a day-to-day basis on the power of the Holy Spirit, working through each and every one of us. We are Redeemer, merciful, courageous community of Christians who desire to live in our marketplace, living lives of humility, integrity and authenticity. So that by the power of the gospel working through us, we can and will see Christ formed in the hearts and lives of Chesley Street and beyond. Let's treasure Jesus. Let's treasure Jesus together, guys. We are made to find our greatest joy when he is our greatest treasure. Father God, I thank you that you delight in each and every one of us. I thank you for how we are journeying as a a community of believers. And I thank you that you have brought us to this point, this coming out of hiding, Lord God, And I pray as Redeemer Church, Chesley Street, we will step up 
and we will step out in faith and in boldness and in compassion and in mercy and in love bring in the gospel but we will not be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation for who all who believe so father God let the gospel cry out in Chesley Street today and Lord, I thank you for each and every man, woman and child in Redeemer Church. I thank you, God, that you have a significant plan and purpose for their lives. I thank you, God, that you have drawn them in to our church family for such a time as this. So, Father God, work powerfully in their lives today. Bring healing where healing is needed, Lord God. Bring restoration where restoration is needed. Bring refreshing where refreshing is needed. So come, Holy Spirit, come in power today. Let our greatest joy be when you are our greatest treasure. In Jesus' name, amen.